without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Sachin Pender, who uh, runs and uh, leads the molecular element, that, uh, well, he, he conducts the molecular orchestra <laughs> of the Wusai Human Performance Alliance, and he's going to tell us about one component right now, Sachin. Yeah. Thank see. you. Thank you. It's really exciting to be here. When you think about performance, the first thing in this post-human genome era that comes from our mind is, do I have the gene? Or do I have the gene to perform at very extreme high peak athletic level? Or do I have the gene to make me resilient to uh, injury and repair? And Yuan was actually very humble because when it comes to genetics of performance, he's the one who is doing really cutting his research here, is poster number 21. <laughs> and then the next thing that irrespective of any kind of athlete you may be, recreational athlete, Olympic athlete, or industrial athlete, that's uh, firefighters, cops, we all think about three things as the foundations of health, how much we should sleep, what we should be eating, when we should be eating, and then exercise, of course, depending on what kind of exercise, what kind of training you do. So I look at performance as these three foundations of health, and then these three habits that we all share affect not only your muscle, tendon, and ligament, they, also, they actually affect almost 10 major organ systems that collectively, that symphony actually help us to have this high peak performance. Of course, we cannot do all of these in humans for obvious reasons, so that's why we develop mouse models, and you have been hearing a lot of mouse model data. So you'll also hear one um, talk from Ming uh, about exercise and its impact on different um, transcriptome in different tissues. And then Geraldine, who will talk tomorrow about the effect of exercise and sex differences. And then Merlin is speaking on this session, and as uh, um, was kind of given a little teaser, how mitochondria in different tissues adapt to exercise. And then we'll have uh, also, we know that exercise affects brain, but how? So we have another speaker. And Manoj, who is speaking tomorrow, will talk about exercise and epigenetics, whether exercise changes. DNA methylation epigenetics in individual cells in different muscle tissues. You heard from Aiden, and then he has his poster, and then Laura talked about um, when, what happens when you exercise and eat less. Uh, so she presented some really awesome molecular map from multiple different tissues. You'll also hear from Sam Ward about injury repair. And then the last thing is, um, I'll talk about timing of nutrition. And this particular piece that I'll talk about just came out in Cell Metabolism um, last month, and this is from Sonok Delta. Okay, so almost 10 years ago, 10 plus one years ago, um, in 2012, we found this very simple and profound effect of timing of food. Um, and the observation goes back to this. We know that light and dark affect our circadian rhythm. And actually I spent, uh, I've been still working on that. But what we found is, we and others found that when we eat, tells the timing to almost every part of our brain except the hypothalamus and the rest of the body that this is morning or evening. So we went back to mice and asked, when do mice eat? Mice are nocturnal, they eat mostly almost 70, 73% of food at night time and 23% of food during daytime. And then when we restrict that food to only eight to 10 hours at night time, we saw a lot of benefits and we called it time-restricted feeding and then it's now popular as intermittent fasting. And people always say that humans don't eat like mice, but actually they do because we have data now from 200,000 free living humans through our app called My Circadian Clock. What we find is between 7 a.m. And, and 7 a.m. and 7 p.m., people eat somewhere between 60 to 75 percent of food, and they eat 25 to 30 percent for the rest, 12 hours. And there are many studies now showing time-restricted eating in which people restrict their eating to 8 to 10 hours. 
uh, can, they do see many benefits. And most of the benefits fall into four buckets. One is optimum immune function. So that means mice, particularly this is well studied in mice, mice are more resilient to infectious disease. So that means they have the right amount of inflammation, but they do have reduced systemic inflammation. We still don't understand why or how. Then optimum physical performance, mice actually can double their endurance when they're on time restricting for eight, nine, or 10 hours, not at 11 or 12. And they also have better motor coordination and particularly male mice somehow build up their muscle mass as they is on time restricting. And we're trying to figure out why female mice can't. And um, optimum brain function, so they do sleep much better and there are some neurodegenerative mouse models, they actually respond much better, their neurodegeneration slows down. And of course, they have more optimum metabolism and detoxification. So those are the four buckets. And if we think about human performance, if we take care of these four foundation buckets, then we can build on other stuff. So over the last 10 years, and actually 10 years ago, Gretchen, I remember, we, we just remembered the conversations she and I had. Uh, about this stuff, and then at that time, I was thinking, okay, so this is mouse study, I'll go back to circadian rhythm, and over the last 10 years, there are only 4,000 papers on this topic. There are mostly more reviews and meta-analysis than real studies, um, and then there are 140 clinical trials, and all these clinical trials and animal studies are showing these are the list of improvements that we see in animals, and many of them are now being replicated in humans. So then the point is, well, if there's so many benefits, then what is going on at molecular level? So we did a very simple experiment, and we went back to the drawing board. We put these young mice on 24 hours diet, or they had to eat everything within nine hours. There is no change in nutrition quality, no change in nutrition quantity. And then over 24 hours, every two hours, we collected 20 plus different organs and brain regions. And so we had nearly 1,000 plus samples that passed the uh, QC for, what did I do? Okay. Um, and then we asked a very simple thing. How many genes go up or down in these 22 different organs? And the bottom line is what we find is nearly 80% of protein coding genes. It's almost like this timing of food just reprograms the whole transcriptome program for the entire mouse. But not all organs are affected equally. Fat tissues respond the most. And then are the digestive organs. And then next come the muscle, heart, and um, muscle and heart. Uh, so those are the next ones. And then the endocrine system also responds. So these are just giving us some clue to what to see, look for next. And also these are giving us clue to what to see next in our human clinical trials because we do have now hundreds of people going through this time restricting and we do have their plasma samples and also their muscle biopsy. Then if we ask, okay, so those are the number of genes but we want to know which pathways are going up or down and the bottom line is the quality control of RNA and protein that build the that are the building block of every cell, their quality control goes up, so then maybe our cells are much better, healthier, and then there is reduced oxidative stress and reduced inflammation. And these are the signatures that we find in five or more tissues. Of course, there are tissue-specific ones. The next thing we asked is, since we collected time series data, we can ask other genes that turn on and off at different times. Because one of the fundamental role of circadian rhythm is just to turn on the right gene at the right time. And what we found is nearly 40% of the genome in mouse was rhythmic under ad libitum fading condition, but nearly 65% of the genome becomes rhythmic. So they actually conduct a molecular orchestra. And what we find is there are two major peaks of activity. One anticipating feeding or during fasting, and then the one that's a response to feeding. And if we look at these waves of gene expression, then most of the things that happen in fasting, are we burn our fat, autophagy, our cellular uh, repair or quality control happens, cell cycle regulation, DNA damage repair, and apoptosis. The, these the three things here are really 
connected to cancer because we know that time restricted feeding mice actually are protected from many types of cancer and even if there is cancer then uh, the cancer tumor grows slower. And then the feeding induced genes are mostly in cellular uh, control. And this is one example in muscle. Uh, and this is the real data heat map from 12 different time points and these are the genes that you're looking at. And the point is you might ask, well, everything looks circadian or, or they're kind of going up and down. But it's almost like every function in, in the, inside a cell is a teamwork. And all these genes have to turn on at the same time for the process to work. And exactly that's what we are seeing in time-restricted feeding group. For example, in autophagy, although the genes are on randomly in a random eating pattern, but time-restricted feeding just synchronizes them. So the autophagy flux actually goes up. And we have seen that in another model in Drosophila. So with that, I will stop here. The take home message is time restricting or time restricted feeding actually improves circadian rhythm. And these kind of atlas that we produced, now it is giving us hypothesis what time of the day if somebody is taking supplements or medications will have much better impact than the other time. And also it gives us a template to figure out how time restricted feeding and exercise at last that other people and we are also producing, how can we synchronize to figure out when is the best time to exercise for muscle growth, muscle repair, etc. Thank you.